think that one of the issues with uh, many German philosophers is that the way they wrote was not particularly helpful for the reader. Yeah. It is much more esoteric as a way of writing. There is a, a, an exception, or I think two exceptions. One is Schopenhauer. I mm -hmm. think Schopenhauer has one of the best proses in philosophical write, writing I have ever read. It is very beautiful writing. Yeah. Uh, and I think Nietzsche, particularly after the birth of tragedy, <laughs> he, wrote, he writes magnificently, I think, in some cases. Well, he criticizes himself later on, 15 odd years later after yeah. this book came out, he criticized himself and basically said these were the splurgings of a child and yes. who was trying to prove himself. And you can, you, can, you can see that. However, I think it's still a good, a good book. I think one good thing that happened to Nietzsche as an author is that he left academia. Yeah. And when he left academia, he did not care about, about the academic norms of writing, which made it very easy for him to be a bit more ecstatic, to be mm. the, the Nietzsche that we like, to be our Nietzsche. Let's say. <laughs> so I think that this helped him to write a bit more ecstatically and yeah. a bit more to, sh to show the kind of immersion in life that he was preaching. But he was, tr he was trying to prove himself as well, right? Yeah. Um, critics didn't take it very well, obviously. However, it, you could see he was young and he was trying to make his way in philosophy. Yes. So. And he wanted to appeal not to academics, but to people. Yeah. And he wanted to draw their attention more towards Schopenhauer and Wagner. Mm. Schopenhauer was not particularly famous during his life but towards the end of his life he he was a bit known and by the end that by the time that nietzsche writes the birth of tragedy he was more uh, prominent mm -hmm. and particularly there were men he was prominent with writers who thought that after the death of hegel uh, there 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 should be a return to kant mm -hmm. and schopenhauer in many ways is a foremost kantian yeah so the thing is and he's also really good in explaining kant in a way that Kant wasn't yeah, good yeah. in explaining himself. I didn't really understand Kant before yeah. I read Schopenhauer. Yeah. So I can see, see where you come from there. So the thing is that apart from their writing, most German philosophers operate within a tradition of German philosophy mm. that if we do not know from the very beginning, if we do not know where it departs from traditional philosophy, we will find it a bit esoteric and a bit meaningless and we're going to just ask, you know, what's the point? Where are you getting at? Um, the thing is, I think we should start a bit by and show Nietzsche's place in German philosophy. And we'll do this by discussing a bit, in a nutshell, uh, Kant mm -hmm. and Schopenhauer. And then we will see how Schopenhauer and his treatment of music form the basic springboard for Nietzsche to write The Birth of Tragedy, but also for other metaphysical commitments of him. Yeah. So... The, in traditional philosophy, the dominant strand is what we call realism mm -hmm. and objective realism that is very much associated with Plato and Aristotle. Now, according to objective realism, we, or we could say that we can provisionally claim that objective realism implies the idea that with reason, with our minds, we can gain knowledge of facts about the world independently of how uh, that we perceive them. So, for instance, we can gain knowledge of the laws of nature, which would apply even if human beings did not exist. Right. This is the realist temperament. Yep. Kant is reacting against the realist temperament, which is dominant threat philosophy. And mm. he thinks that metaphysics leads to irresolvable disagreements mm. that cannot be um, resolved. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and that um, in order for philosophy to move forward, there needs to be a stress on agreement. Right. And we, could, we can say that this is a sort of non-elitist feature or a sort of egalitarian sentiment that Kant's bring, Kant brings into philosophy that Plato or Aristotle did not have. Mm. Because they, are not, they would not say that in order for you to know the truth, everyone must be convinced that you know the truth. Uh, they could say that, you know, that's the truth. Well, sometimes, you know, we just have to agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. So Kant wanted to overcome these irresolvable uh, disagreements. And he said that they arise because 
thinker philosophers have thought that reason gives us knowledge of the world independently of how the mind perceives it. Mm. So he thought that re in their work, <laughs> reason is supposed to exit the domains of sensible experience. And he thought that that's a mistake. Mm. And we can only talk about the world as it appears to the mind. Hence his phenomena and noumena distinction. Yep. So in the place of Aristotelian and Platonist objective realism, he substitutes transcendental idealism, according to which the mind, we, we can gain knowledge of the world and we can, because the world as we see is a construct of sense experience and mental impositions upon sense experience. So he would say that the world we see is un already conceptualized. It is already a world in space time, in, in time where uh, we have uh, caus causality, yeah. where cause and effect. This is his categories of under understanding, right? Yes. That's, what, that's his term for it. Yes. Yeah. And he thinks that there we see the mental imposition. So concepts are necessary because the mind puts them into our yeah. experience. So he would say that basically whenever we talk about the, the world as being such and such, metaphysically speaking, we are mistaken. We, instead of saying the world is such and such, full stop, we should say the mind perceives the world as if it contains a ex spatial extension, a temporal sequence, and a causal sequence. And behind all of this is the numino numino world. Yes. Which is what we can't see and what we can't perceive. Yes, yeah. it's the thing in itself. Yeah. as he calls it. Yeah. And it is what, it is the metaphysical reality that Plato and Aristotle and most thinkers in the in Western philosophy thought that we can be revealed by thinking mm. and by, by reason. Yeah. Okay, so the thing is that Schopenhauer departs from Kant in the following way. He was a foremost Kantian, but he started talking about suffering. Mm. And he pointed attention towards suffering in a way that no one else did before him. And this leads him to a very significant tension. On the one hand, he writes as a Kantian, as someone who says that the principle of sufficient reason reigns supreme only in the domain of the phenomena, mm. the world as the mind perceives it. He started talking about a will. Yeah. Because uh, Kant was a Christian, yes. whereas Schopenhauer was an atheist. I, I think so. So within that semiotic slot where Kant had the new middle world, Schopenhauer inputted will, which was this like cosmic will that drives everything. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So Kant wanted, said that he wanted to make room for faith. Yeah. He wanted to curtail reason in order to make room for faith. Yeah. But Schopenhauer had no such faith. And he started talking about the will as being a metaphysical force, mm. as being the ultimate force. And he has this image where he says that the ultimate basis of reality is a blind, irrational will. Yep. And uh, hence we have Schopenhauerian pessimism. Mm. Are you familiar with it? I am, yeah. <laughs> what, what, how would you describe it? It's, it's pretty dark. That life is a mistake, yeah. um, life is suffering. Um, Nietzsche goes on in the text to basically compare this to uh, the wisdom of Salinas. Yes. Um, we'll get onto that in a yeah. bit, but it's odd because Schopenhauer was, as far as I know, from a very privileged background. He was very rich and I think so, yeah. um, well yeah. endowed, you yes. know, so it's odd that he was so obsessed with suffering, I suppose. He was not a friend uh, of business. Yeah. In, yes, and uh, he had a very solitary life. Yeah. Um, I think in the way that uh, Nietzsche was a friend with uh, Wagner, uh, Schopenhauer was a friend with Goethe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Just. Um, there was also Schopenhauer's influence of the sorry the the Hindu Upanishads influence on Schopenhauer. Yes. So the Hindus have this idea of Maya, um, which is Kant. What Kant talks about is the ph phenomenological world. The Hindus talk about Maya, which yeah. is what we can see. Um, it's the world that we live in. Um, behind that is Brahman, which would be the numinal world. Yeah. Uh, Brahman is the this all-encompassing chaos and oneness, which everything comes out of and is created from. Yeah. Um, within that is 
Atman, which is the individual will which Schopenhauer talks about. So what Schopenhauer is basically saying is he's taking from the Upanishads this idea that there's this primordial um, reality reality behind the veneer of actual reality, yeah. which is just an illusion. And it's this, un this idea of illusion, basically. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Schopenhauer was really fond of the Vedas, yeah. the Hindu text, and they, uh, they say that he was sleeping next to it. Mm. That he had a copy of the <laughs> Vedas sleeping next to it. Trying to get the aura from it. Yes, and he <laughs> thought that there would be a sort of spiritual revival in Europe mm. with through the spirit of Hinduism. Well, the Upanishads had been, when he started writing about them, I think they'd only just been translated by a French guy. Yes. I, I forget the name. but um, yeah. I don't remember the name, but yeah. he, Schopenhauer was aware of it and yeah. he thought that there was a very deep wisdom mm. there. So it's interesting because the major text of Schopenhauer is called The World as Will and Representation. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, he is saying that the world of concepts, the world that we perceive, is the world of representation. Yeah. But on the other hand... So that's, that's Maya. Yes. Um, yeah. On the other hand, even if, d despite the fact that he was a Kantian and that implies that he thinks that the thing in itself is unknowable, mm. he started talking about the will as a sort of metaphysical force, as we as said. A, as a being, yes. in a way, which is odd. Yes. Yeah. And so that seems to commit him to a metaphysical position. Yeah, yeah. yeah that the fundamental aspect of reality is that there is a drive towards reproduction mm -hmm. that is blind and irrational. And yeah. uh, that basically he thought, and this is where his pessimism comes into the picture, yeah. he thought that there is no consolation to be had other than momentary experiences of music where we or uh, ascetics. Yeah, so this is his concept of ascetic arrest. Um, so he sees the eye as uh, sort of the organ of suffering because yes. the eye looks for either objects of desire. By eye, you mean the self? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so it's the will's organ of, yes. it's the, I suppose it's a conduit of suffering because we're yes. constantly looking for either a mate or food, um, both of which are... Intrinsic suffering, right? Yes. In, in, in his view. He would say that willing constitutes suffering because yeah. willing is basically um, to be driven towards mm. something that you do not have. And basically he would say that the satisfaction out of completing your goals yeah. isn't, isn't worth the yeah. bother. Yeah. And uh, he was saying that basically the only, th there, is no way, there is no way out of it. That uh, suicide is not a way out of it because you will be reborn. And yeah, I think yeah, yeah. he has a quote where he says, I don't know if this is by Schopenhauer or by <coughs> Schopenhauer, where he says that after life, we are what we were before life. Mm. And so he says that basically suicide will get you nowhere <laughs> because in the same way that you were, you were not asked to be born, you were born out of that blind, irrational will, you will be reborn again. This is where it lines up. His two solutions, if you can call them solutions, line up with, well, one of them lines up with Buddha, which is just go full ascetic yes. um, to achieve nirvana, which is absolute, um, ultimate is the absolute- um, A state of non-attachment. State of non-attachment and there, thereby yeah. suffering. Yes. The other is, um, which he says is the more preferable uh, route is to go to aesthetic arrest, which is to create yes. works of art and to look at works of art because when you're looking at a work of art, the the eye, for some reason, forgets its desires, yes, and um, thereby transcends out of suffering. Yes. So through, do you think through, that? So it's a, it's a pure subject looking at a pure object, and yeah. that sort of uplifts one. So he would oneself. say, do you think that we can put it in the following way? He thought that in appreciating a work of art there is a fusion of subject and object yeah. and we sort of transcend even for a fleeting second yeah for a for a just a moment we transcend the domain of suffering yeah. and we become we transcend ourselves back to the buddha point i think that he would say that um, it's not just the buddha he would say that the early desert fathers of christianity mm. they had uh, this ascetic drive ascetic drive but unfortunately he thinks that it is uh, for very few people and i think he says at some point that you know i'm, I'm not such a good person 
I wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, he so yeah. he, he, th he was really explicit about not being able to live up to I suppose the ascetic can, ideal. I suppose you can see that in the history of Buddhism. Obviously, Buddhism was basically nihilistic. Yeah. Uh, now it's they worship the Buddha. You know, yes. Buddha is sort of a deity. So it's yeah. The question maybe is a trickle down there. When we talk about it as being nihilistic, do we talk about it as being nihilistic in the sense that? there is no value attached to the world of here and now, mm. or in the sense of there being no value in living at all. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.